So Karen, did I understand you? You want me to, I'll just, I'll take my video off when, uh, after I introduce Kurt. And then uh, how do you want to do Q and A? You're going to do it? Okay, you'll manage that. All right. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to everyone attending today. My name is Karen Burkhardt. I'm the Executive Director of the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council. We are pleased to welcome you to today's program, Building the Post-Election, Post-COVID World. I want to point out a few functions about submitting questions and comments. For those that are here in person, you may raise your hand as usual. If you are attending via webinar, at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there is a chat function for general comments that can be seen by all participants. There's also a Q&A function for submitting written questions and a raised hand function if you'd like to ask a question directly and verbally yourself. We'll be deferring questions until after the presentation, so please be patient if you have your hand up. I just wanna take a moment to thank our supporters Thank you to the Tiemann's Foundation, the Wells Fargo Private Bank, the Richard Petritz Foundation, Mackenzie Place, and thank you to our institutional members, El Pomar Foundation, Colorado College, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, Pikes Peak Community College, Colorado Springs Chamber, and EDC, Siva Charter High School, and Fountain Valley School. And with that, I am going to turn things over to our Emeritus Board member, Sky Forrester, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Karen. And it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Kurt Volker, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, this has been a process going back close to two years uh, of trying to get Kurt here. Uh, now here means something different. Uh, so he's not really here, but we're, he's here with us, <clears throat> and we're, we're delighted uh, for that. Um, and we get to look ahead to a post-election, post-COVID world, and uh, we think the post-election world will start in January, uh, but we're not sure. And the post-COVID world will start sometime maybe in 2021, mid-year, who knows. Uh, but we'll learn more about that from Ambassador Volker. Um, he is uh, a leading expert in U.S. foreign and national security policy and has been in government and academe and in the private sector uh, for over 30 years. Uh, most recently from 2017 2019, at which point he became a household name in many respects, um, he was U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations um, and he was ambassador, U.S. Ambassador uh, 2008 to 2009. Uh, he's currently Managing Director International and Co-Chair of the Advisory Board at BGR Group. Uh, also serves on the Advisory Board of uh, uh, an artificial intelligence startup company called Augustus, and he's been uh, an, on, previously served as a director, director uh, of a number, number of investment funds. Um, he was from 2012 to 2019, which is where many may have known him, uh, the founding di executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, which is based in Washington, D.C., but part of the Arizona State University. Uh, he remains a senior advisor and trustee of a number of um, uh, U.S. and European um, boards uh, and councils, um, senior advisor at the Atlantic Council, advisory board of the U.S. Institute of P for Peace, um, and my personal favorite, a trustee of the American College of the Mediterranean in Aix-en-Provence in France. Um, and I'd like to sign up for that one to join you, uh, Kurt, if I could. 
Uh, but without any further ado, it is a great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, we wish you were here in person, and we look forward to having you in person uh, when circumstances allow, but we're very grateful for having you to do this. And I'll now black myself out and turn it over to you, Kurt. Well, Sky, thank you so much. And Karen, thank you. It is really a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I want to thank everyone who is bothering to sign in on their computers or those who managed to come in person in Colorado Springs. I wish I was there with you. Uh, as Sky said, this was an event long in the planning. Um, I had a son who attended uh, Colorado College. And the idea was that, well, I'd go out for a college visit and uh, maybe stop in at the World Affairs Council, maybe uh, talk to some of the students at Colorado College, all of those things. And unfortunately, for a variety of different reasons, scheduling and then the coronavirus, we were never able to pull this together. But I'm really delighted that we've been able to manage this virtually. And so delighted to, to be with you in that way. Um, Sky and I had the privilege of uh, working together. I, I certainly enjoyed uh, spending time with him when we were working on the CFE Treaty, Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, in 1989, 1990. Uh, so quite some time ago, and we've managed to, to stay in touch over the years uh, often again. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be back here virtually, although I wish we were doing it in person. Um, the um, uh, point in the bio that I wanted to come back to that, that Sky mentioned was that I spent seven years running the McCain Institute, which was part of Arizona State University and named for Senator McCain and his family going back a couple of generations. And I, I mention that because it goes all the way back to the first time I met Senator McCain in 1995. Uh, I was leaving the US Embassy in Budapest. I was trying to figure out what to do as a foreign service move after that. And um, I met, had a chance to meet uh, someone who's become a longtime friend, Randy Schooneman, who was working for Senator McCain and also then later for Senator Lott. And uh, he said, you know, in the Foreign Service, you know, you can go do repeat assignments, this embassy, that embassy, but there are these programs where we take people over to the Hill for a year and you might want to consider working on Capitol Hill. And so I thought, well, that is interesting. I never really seriously considered that. So I interviewed and I was accepted into the program and then you have to choose what Senate office you want to go work in. And I interviewed with two. One of them was Senator John McCain, and the other one was Senator Joe Biden. And I opted at the time to work for Senator McCain. And the rationale that I had was that, well, Senator McCain is part of the Republican majority, and the majority gets to set the agenda in the Senate. So I thought that would be a good choice. And in addition to that, he was not on the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate. Uh, he was on the Armed Services Committee, but he didn't have anyone staffing him just on foreign policy. Joe Biden, on the other hand, was the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations Committee, and he had a whole team of people working for him on foreign relations. And the Democrats were in the minority, so they couldn't set the agenda as much. So I ended up working for Senator John McCain, and that was a relationship and a, and a choice that has uh, had ripple effects over 30 years. But now I'm also in, amused to see that uh, Senator Joe Biden, who I stayed in touch with over time as well, is uh, now the Democratic nominee and has as good a chance as any person in this country of being elected president of the United States in, in two weeks time. Uh, so it is, it is very interesting to see those developments with the hindsight of 30 years. Uh, the topic tonight that uh, Karen and Sky have given me and which we talked about in some of the planning calls was uh, US foreign policy in the post-corona world, uh, how to rebuild the post-corona world from what we knew before. And I'd like to offer a few thoughts on that, uh, try to organize them a little bit, but then I'd really like to make sure we leave a lot of time for question and answer and commentary. Uh, I think these Zoom meetings are great but they're always better when they're more of a conversation and less of one person talking. Uh, so I'll just kick it off and then I'd love to turn it over for a broader dialogue. The first thing I would say about uh, the post coronavirus world is that we're not going to be in it for a long time. Uh, as much as we would love to see better treatment, as much as we would love to have vaccines, 
it's going to be a very long time before we can go about our daily lives without thinking too much about the coronavirus. Uh, it's something we're going to have to take into account in our travel, in our business, in our relationships, in the way we, we do things going forward. There's really no way to avoid it. And uh, as a result of that, I think in, when thinking about the quote unquote post coronavirus world, what we really need to think about is living with coronavirus for a long time, a few years to several years for sure. And living with it is something different entirely. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to travel uh, even during these pandemic times. I took a three week trip to Turkey, to Montenegro and to the Republic of Georgia. Uh, in each place, uh, they had protocols about wearing masks. They had hand sanitizer available everywhere. They had expectations about wearing masks, not only indoors, but outdoors if you're in a crowded area. Um, most of the restaurants and dining were all out of doors. Uh, but with those protocols in place, most places were relatively open. In other words, there was not an economic shutdown. Uh, businesses were open, restaurants were open, hotels were open. You could go about your normal activities. You just did it with a high level of precaution. And I think that is a lesson that, that we need to be thinking about for our own country and the way we do business as well. There's got to be a middle ground between shutting everything down or not applying pr protective measures and protocols to prevent spread of the disease. And I felt that on this trip, it was eye-opening for me at least, that it could be so productive and so normal compared to what it has been like living in Washington for the preceding six months. So living with the disease with appropriate protocols and getting on with business, that's the first thing. Second thing I would say about this, this world ahead of us is that the global economy is going to take a bigger hit for a longer period of time than anyone is currently assuming. We all talk about a V-shaped recovery. We look at the stock market that is doing really well. Uh, we look at the way our own lives have been able to adapt. We've, we've put in place telecommuting pro, um, protocols for a lot of the white collar jobs. A lot of the blue collar ones have been able to keep working. And we just think we're gonna be going back to normal fairly quickly. Uh, but my best gut judgment on this is that it's not gonna be so easy. Uh, the U.S. is privileged to be a global economic leader. We're a trendsetter. In many ways, I think our economy will be among the first to recover. But a lot of other countries are trailer, uh, trailing in economic development. They depend upon a robust U.S. economy, a robust European economy, developing world economy, trade, investment. And I, I do see a pattern with the reduction in travel, the reduction in tourism, the reduction in therefore uh, everything from uh, hospitality industry to travel and transportation industry uh, to uh, things like commercial real estate. Uh, there's going to be a big dip and it's going to take a lot of the rest of the world, a lot of emerging markets, which had driven economic growth in the past. They're taking a disproportionate hit and it's going to take an awful lot for them to come back. So I think we're going to see a depression and a distortion of economic activity compared to what we knew before for several years at least. And what that means when you talk about a post-coronavirus world is that we are not going back to where we were. We are learning how to live successfully and productively in a different environment. One where we are applying the best protocols for getting on with business as opposed to shutting down or thinking that everything had just reopened the way it was. We're gonna be in a new world. So those are the first two points. A third point, which is um, a somewhat concerning point for me, is that in this environment where developed democracies are borrowing lots of money, they're putting up walls against immigration, they're putting up walls to prevent spread of the virus, including restrictions on travel, restrictions on entry, imposed quarantines if foreign visitors do come. Uh, these are all things that are meant to prevent the spread of the virus or to control the, uh, the risk environment in a country. But they have a pernicious effect as well of restricting the opportunity and the 
uh, entrepreneurial spirit and capacity of the societies themselves. Dictatorships don't have this problem. Dictatorships are perfectly happy to clamp down on their citizens. They run state-owned enterprises and state-driven business deals. They tend to be relatively inefficient in good times, but in bad times, they are suddenly going to appear to be cash rich. They're not going to be emerging from the coronavirus with the same debts and deficits that we are emerging from this uh, crisis with. And as a result, they're gonna have a bit of a head start. They're gonna have a bit of an upper hand in trying to press for advantage in a post-coronavirus world. If you think about Russia, their state-owned enterprises or their state-driven enterprises are not the most efficient in the best of times, but they're largely extractive and they do have a marketplace. Chinese companies, on the other hand, are already relatively efficient and market competitive. And, and I am concerned that they will be even more so as we emerge from this coronavirus crisis. So this gives them an upper hand economically. When you think about state mechanisms, these countries have used the coronavirus as an excuse, and they have used it to uh, impose greater restrictions on freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, and tracking uh, of their populations through cyber means without re regard for any privacy in ways that would have been unimaginable before the coronavirus struck. Uh, in fact, even in some democracies, we've seen impositions of measures like that, countries like Hungary or Poland or uh, where we just were in Georgia, even though they are democracies against the virus, that the threshold tolerance for intrusive measures from the government has gone up and populations are willing to accept that. That means that we are seeing a creeping uh, authoritarianism, not only from authoritarian states, but even in the way some democracies are behaving. Uh, this is going to be a problem and a challenge for societies for the long term as well. Uh, when we consider this, and I guess this is now um, a fourth point, that we are therefore at a stage where we're going to be living with coronavirus. That's one. The global economy is going to be worse and difficult. That's two. And our adversaries, uh, dictatorships, authoritarians, and so forth, are going to have an advantage in that environment. That's three. Then the fourth conclusion that we have that I would make is that we are therefore in an inflection point not too dissimilar from what we saw at the end of World War II, where the democracies had basically exhausted themselves. The Soviet Union was ascendant, and it really fell upon those democracies left standing, and especially the United States, to pull our side of the world together, to get developed democracies who favor freedom, who favor democracy, market economy, security, rule of law, to band together and to try to favor our own economies and our own societies first, not on a national basis. And this is important because we hear so much about nation building at home or America first. I think we need to think about allies first. And we need to think about a democratic community in the world first. Uh, we should be hoping that countries that are maybe teetering a little bit right now end up on our side. We should want countries like Turkey, which have an authoritarian leader at the moment, to come back to being staunch allies within NATO, supporters of a broader transatlantic relationship, and a general strategic alliance with the United States, uh, and then developing their democratic systems further over time. Uh, we need to pull this community together because if we don't, we're going to find that the authoritarians and, and others in the world will have an advantage that will grow over time. It'll be more and more difficult to overcome. Uh, I only need to mention China's Belt and Road policy or its uh, 5G technologies, where they are already pre-coronavirus using their advantages to try to build long-term advantage uh, that favors China economically, but also in political and security terms. Uh, we've begun to wake up to that in the past few years. I'd say that both parties, Democrats and Republicans, are equally committed to pushing back on China. Uh, but we need to take that policy and then turn it into something affirmative as well of the way we build a transatlantic and trans-Pacific democratic community of like-minded countries that are trying to preserve and build a global liberal economy 
uh, and also one that will protect our systems of values and government and democracy and provide security for those systems. It's a big, big task, big, 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 task. Big, big task before. So I'm going to pause there. Those are sort of my observations. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear criticisms and pushback, and I'd also love to hear questions. And, and uh, we have plenty of time, and I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation. All right, I think we're open for questions now. Do you have uh, anyone in the audience? And if not, I will be happy to start with one. You have spoken a lot about um, the state of democracy. Can you comment on how we, as the leader of the free world, uh, are, how are we um, ascending in our, or maintaining our democratic norms? A great thing about the United States is that we are the most self-critical country in the world. Um, we have a system, we have open society, we have media that will criticize any leader, no matter what, no matter who. We have vigorous debates, we have vigorous civil society. So as much as we complain about the state of our own democracy, the fact that we have these vigorous debates about the state of our democracy is itself proof that we have a vigorous democracy. So I think the first thing we should do is take a little comfort in the fact that we have these structures in our society. Uh, second thing I would say about that is the uh, institutions and the way we run democracy, which we've done under our constitution for well over 200 years, are very, very sturdy. Uh, it is not easy to mess with these institutions. They do play their role and they, and they play them quite effectively. And I'm not really worried about the political dialogue and the noise that we hear about institutions because when you look at how they perform, they in fact are very, very, very strong. So that's another indicator. Third thing I would say is, and I, and I take some comfort in this too, uh, we are, in my view, at the end of a particular moment in time. If you look at the leadership of our institutions or our major political parties, you're talking about people who are largely in their 70s and some in their 80s. Uh, Vice President Biden is 77, former Vice President. President Trump is 74. Uh, Mitch McConnell is 77, I believe, or 76. Um, Chuck Schumer, if he becomes majority leader, will be 71. Nancy Pelosi is 80. Uh, so we have a generation in power now representing both political parties that is not going to be here in 2024 in the same positions. And when you look around the landscape, you can see younger people, people of a new generation in the Senate, in the House, people who will be presidential candidates for either party, whether it's Nikki Haley or Kamala Harris or Marco Rubio or, uh, whom, or you know, governors from around the country. We're talking about people in their 50s and 60s. And that kind of renewal is also, I think, a great, great attribute of our country. Uh, you don't see it everywhere in the world that um, there is a natural progression like this. And I do believe that we will have a, a very vigorous national renewal uh, from 2024 onward. Wonderful. Let me um, start to take you to some of these participant questions. Uh, this is from Sky to Kurt. Let me take you back to that part of the world in which you served. Number one, how would you assess Ukraine's current situation? And number two, how would you assess NATO's viability after four years of an administration that has generated doubts about US commitment to Europe? Um, well, thank you for the question. and. Uh, there are several things in that. Um, I think I'd like to start by answering uh, a question that may come up later, but I'll just throw it on the table now and maybe people want to come back to it. There has been a lot more continuity in U.S. foreign policy, whether it's toward Ukraine or toward NATO or toward Russia, than uh, the media and the commentary makes it seem. And I'll just give the example about NATO. Uh, we had uh, 
Bob Gates, Secretary of Defense under both President Bush and President Obama, uh, complaining when he left office that the U.S. share of NATO defense spending went from 50% to 75%. And this was politically unsustainable. We had President Clinton, when he was elected, saying that it's the economy, stupid. When we had President Bush elected, George W. Bush, he said, um, we are um, not going to do um, nation building abroad. President Obama said, we're gonna do nation building at home and we're not going to fight other people's civil wars. And we're going to pivot to Asia uh, because we're out of the 1980s and um, we don't have to worry about Russia. We're gonna reset with Russia. Uh, and allies have been freeloaders because they're not spending enough on defense. So when Donald Trump comes up and says allies are not spending on defense and we're gonna have America first and we need to, our NATO allies to live up to the challenge, this is not some radical new policy. This is a, a policy that has gone back at least to the Reagan administration. And American presidents have said roughly the same thing, although they say it in different ways. And that's the second thing I would say about this is that President Trump's style, undeniable, is direct, blunt, vulgar, and uh, offends many people. But the substance of what he has done is not so different from what had been done by his predecessor, President Obama, or what I would expect to come even from a Biden administration if, if Vice President Biden were to be elected. Uh, if you were to think about uh, support for NATO, yes, there's support. Forward deployment of forces in Poland, Baltic states, Romania, as President Trump has done, Vice President Biden would not reverse that. Calling for NATO allies to spend 2% of DD, GDP on defense, a Biden administration would not change that. Uh, if it comes to moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, I, I seriously doubt that a Biden administration would reverse that. Tough policy on China, including tariffs, to uh, raise the cost to China of taking advantage of, of our open economy. I don't see a Biden administration reversing that. So I'd see there would be a lot of continuity in what is there. Now that then comes to the particular issues of NATO and Ukraine that, that Sky mentioned in his question. Um, in the case of Ukraine, you had a lot of support for Ukraine under the Obama administration. In 2014, there was an indigenous objection to the leadership of the country when they turned away from the EU and NATO. That government, Yanukovych's government, then uh, faced protests and fired upon the protesters and killed 100 people. As a result, the protests got bigger and Yanukovych fled the country. And then the parliament voted to remove him as president and to temporarily install a new president until they could have a new election. So that was a very democratic and constitutional process in Ukraine, which resulted in uh, a new and much more democratic and westward leaning government in Ukraine from that point. They had full support from the uh, Obama administration. They have had full support from the Trump administration. And I, I spent two years working on this. One of the things that the Obama administration did not do was allow for the supply of defensive arms to Ukraine, including lethal defensive arms, so that the Ukrainians could defend themselves. They're being attacked by Russia. Russia has, attack, has annexed or claimed to annex Crimea, a part of Ukraine. They have taken over a part of Eastern Ukraine. And there is still today fighting going on there every week. And Ukrainians are still getting killed by Russian forces in Eastern Ukraine. And the Trump administration at least lifted the arms embargo on Ukraine, and we are now supplying lethal defensive arms to Ukraine while continuing to support them in other ways as well. I don't think that Biden administration will change that policy whatsoever if Vice President Biden is elected. So I think we're going to see continued strong support there. As for NATO, I think there's going to be a combination of pressure on allies to spend on defense, a um, caution, about the level of US troop deployments in Europe. President Trump has already announced withdrawals from Germany. I have a hard time seeing a Biden administration with major budget deficits and a desire to shift spending away from defense that they would be willing to reintroduce those forces in Europe. So again, a lot of continuity. The tone will change considerably. There's no question they're different personalities, but I do see a lot of continuity in policy. Thank you. 
Okay, we have actually several written written I questions. I thought that spoke a few right comments. Very good. Uh, from our friend and member Hillary Dusing, I love the idea of forming a trans-Pacific partnership, but being from New Zealand, it's too late. China owns the South Pacific now. Their infrastructure, quote unquote, developments are no more than coercion to the leadership of these countries to bow to China. Additionally, in Southeast Asia, they are also owned by Chinese drug runners, Laos, Myanmar, et cetera. I appreciate your comments. Well, thank you. Um, you are certainly right to point out the aggressiveness of China's policies. And I say aggressive thinking primarily of an economic in and investment context. They are using the resources that they have, including state enterprises and, and state uh, financing, to expand their influence all over. Uh, you mentioned Southeast Asia, and that is true. It's not only Southeast Asia. It goes uh, to Central Asia, the Caucasus, Africa, even Latin America. Uh, we see that. But I'm not as pessimistic as you in thinking that we've already lost. Uh, my, my belief is that most countries, and certainly I have a lot of contacts in a lot of the places I just mentioned, whether it's in Georgia or Ukraine or Italy or Germany or Vietnam, uh, these are, or Thailand, Singapore, these are places that are not happy about the growing dominance of China or the pressure they feel from China. They are looking for alternatives. In fact, I, I remember vividly a lunch I had with the ambassador of Italy in the United States in Washington, where he had just been demarched by the Secretary of State to say, we don't want you to use Huawei and their 5G technology because it's going to create risks for everybody in NATO. Uh, we want you to abandon this. And his comment to me over lunch was, I completely agree. Uh, I, what the Secretary of State said to me is exactly what I would like to do. But give me an alternative that China is there with the technology and with the cash and with the investment. What's the alternative? I don't have it. Uh, we would love to have an American alternative technology-wise, infrastructure-wise, but it's not there. And that's where I think that there is an appetite for something else. We need to keep working uh, on developing that alternative. And then one final thought on this, it reminds me, uh, I, every semester I end up giving a lecture on my view of negotiations. There's, you know, all kinds of books have been written about negotiations, getting to yes and so forth. But I have uh, five simple rules for negotiations. Um, I'll skip to the fifth one, which is, you know, at, at the end of the day, once you've been successful, assuming you have been, remember, nothing is ever over. That you, you may lose one day, you may win another day, but the world still goes on. If you won, you'll be challenged. If you lost, there'll be another day to fight again. And that's the way everything works. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Gerfine. You have a particular knowledge of Ukraine. Do you care to comment on the Hunter Biden emails? I hear both that they are quote unquote fake news on, part, on the part of the Russian disinformation campaign and on other news sources that they're real. Do you have any insight that you would care to share? <laughs> well, I don't have any additional facts to provide you with um, as compared with anything you, you would have seen uh, uh, reported in the media. So I'm reading the same things that you are. What I can do is try to offer a, a couple pieces of my perspective. One of them is that I know Ukraine quite well. Uh, it has uh, a tragic uh, post-1989 history, I would say. They had a botched privatization. They have a handful of people, we're talking five or six, that own about 20% of the GDP of the country and control about double that. They control almost all of the national media in the country. So this is an oligarch driven society. You have institutions, you have a parliament, you have a government, you have courts, but they're all corrupted by the power of these robber barons. In our country, we dealt with this a little over a hundred years ago through antitrust legislation, breaking up the holdings of people legalizing them in some way, Ford, Rockefeller, Carnegie, et cetera. They, they weren't outcasts, but we did break up the empires. And that is exactly what Ukraine needs to do as well. And until it does, it is significantly under the influence of, of these empires. 
And then you are faced with corruption, which is not a problem that is um, a standalone problem. Corruption is a tool. You have a corruption problem in Ukraine because of the oligarch problem. It's the currency of the realm. It's how you get things done. And so in that environment, corruption is actually pervasive. So that's something to think about when you look at Ukraine, no matter who you are or what you're dealing with. Second thing is I've known former Vice President Biden uh, since 1995 when I first had that interview with him. So I, I guess that's, I do my math, 25 years. Um, and I've interacted with him many times uh, over the course of those 25 years, not as, not as close friends, but, but certainly, you know, knowing him and, and, and seeing him periodically. And I will tell you that there is no way that I can see how Vice President Biden was corrupted in his performance of his duties as Vice President by the interests of money for his son or his family in any way. Uh, uh, he's, a, he's very much a straight arrow when it comes to the conduct of duties of office as he sees them. Now, you can say that he has been wrong on different policy issues. That's easy to debate. You know, did you agree with his position on the war in Iraq? Or did you agree with his position on Afghanistan? Or do you agree with his position now on Afghanistan? That's all debatable. But in terms of his integrity, I, I don't think that is really up for question. And so when I look at what's happened with Hunter Biden, it's, it's also a sad story. Um, he was clearly in a position of benefiting uh, from the famous name of his father. And uh, he, he was able to get board memberships that were beneficial. Uh, that's not the first time anyone has done that. It's not illegal and it doesn't imply anything unethical. Uh, but he, I think that is the nature there. The second is that even though you can make an assumption that Vice President Biden uh, was not corrupted in any way in the performance of his duties, it does not mean that it was not the intention of the Ukrainians in this story to try to corrupt. I think that's clearly why they brought Hunter Biden onto the board. They wanted to whitewash the name of their company, which had a history of corruption, by bringing him on. And they're hoping that this would give them some kind of access and influence. And so that's where I think there's a real dividing line in this story. One of them is the persistence of a legacy of corruption in Ukraine. Um, and then the other is what, if anything, did that mean in terms of performance of US policy? I'd say they're, they're actually quite separate events and separable in the way you think about it. Thank you. We have, I'm gonna take one more question uh, submitted uh, as written, and then I'm gonna take a live question. And this question comes from someone who I believe is a former colleague of yours, David Bain. Oh, Two yeah. questions from a colleague, yeah. Uh, first, are there any foreign policy issues that you see ripe for bipartisan cooperation, regardless of the results of the election? And secondly, do you have any suggestions for reinvigorating the Foreign Service and our foreign policy institutions? Well, well, those are great questions as well. And David, great to hear from you. I hope you're doing well. We worked together in the State Department for several years. And um, on the, the first one of those, I guess the question has disappeared now. Uh, I want to bring it back so I can refer to it. There we go. Um, so I would say almost all issues are ripe for bipartisan cooperation. It just doesn't sound like it. For example, um, there is a bill pending in the Senate right now to increase security assistance for Ukraine to $425 million. It is co-sponsored by uh, Senator Gene Shaheen and Senator Risch, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, that's, that is bipartisan support. And if you were to have it put to a vote, it hasn't come to a vote yet. If you were to put it to a vote, I'm pretty confident it would get in excess of 80 votes in the Senate. So that's support for Ukraine. I think you would find support for sanctions against Nord Stream 2. I think you would find support for continued uh, tariffs and uh, tough measures against China, including on technology. And some of the things the Trump administration has done would stay. If you look at trying to garner uh, Arab state recognition for the state of Israel and increased diplomatic relations, you're going to find there's bipartisan support for that. If you talk about uh, support for Guaido in Venezuela and seeing um, Maduro eventually depart 
Heller from that country, you're going to find bipartisan support for that. Uh, and you can go on and on. Uh, I even think, sadly, in my view, because I believe our work in Afghanistan has been important and successful and needs to be followed through. But nonetheless, I think you'll find today that there is bipartisan support for reducing the U.S. footprint in Afghanistan, if not eliminating it, and uh, forcing the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan to figure something out. I think there's bipartisan support for that. There's bipartisan support for withdrawing from Syria. So I think there's quite a bit there that can be built on. The tone needs to change, and the, the media reporting of this may never actually reflect that they actually agree, but there is an awful lot there. Uh, let's turn to an area of difference, and one I think that is critical. Uh, there is a major difference on the U.S. relationship with Germany and with the European Union. Uh, here, I think that if we need to, if we want to get anything done in the world, we need support from our European allies, whether it is in the UN and the Security Council with France and Germany, uh, with France and the UK, uh, whether it's in the EU with Germany, whether it's in NATO also with Germany, the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, we're going to need Turkey. We're going to need France uh, in Libya. Uh, Turkey again, France again, Italy again. Uh, dealing with Russia, we definitely need Germany for that. So um, we need to be working together with our allies. I think that has been undervalued in the past few years. And I hope that whether it's a second term Trump or a uh, Biden administration, we'd be able to correct that. Uh, that we, we need to be working with our allies because we need them in dealing with all these issues. Uh, I'm struck, just commenting here, uh, not too long ago, I remember talking about the Iran issue, people comment, oh, well, we need Russia. We need a reset with Russia because we need Russia on Iran, we need Russia on Afghanistan. So, no, we don't need Russia. <laughs> we can do these things without Russia, but we do need our allies. Um, then the second part of your question is suggestions on the Foreign Service. Uh, I do have a lot of suggestions here. Uh, they are not going to be all popular, I'm sorry to say, uh, but I believe them. Uh, the first thing is that you need to have an open foreign service system. By open, I mean you need to be able to join at various levels, junior level, mid-level, senior level. Um, you need to be able to leave if you're in the foreign service and come back. So you can have a three, five, seven year excursion and go do something else. I think one of the things the foreign service suffers from is that the current structure is people are brought in at the entry level, and their career is only within the Foreign Service with a few occasional details here or there until they leave. And so you're not bringing in fresh blood, fresh knowledge, uh, different practices, different technology, private sector experiences. Uh, we don't do that until we bring political appointees in at the top. I think that's a mistake, and I think we should have a more open Foreign Service system. Second thing I would do is I would put more resource, resource responsibility in the hands of the senior managers of the State Department. Senior managers I'm counting as assistant secretaries and ambassadors. Right now, they have almost zero authority over their own budgets. Uh, that these, these budgets are decided centrally within the State Department and then allocated to them. If they had control of the budgets, and I would also add to that some control, uh, in at least in terms of a handful of promotions and a handful of assignments so that they could be rewarding the best performers. Uh, I think you could get a lot more out of the Foreign Service that way. But because everything is out of their hands and centralized and blind, uh, it means that there's really no ability for the managers to control resources to advance the priorities that the administration has in terms of policy. So those are just a couple of reforms. I could give you five more, um, but I think we'd bore the rest of our audience. Those insiders of us would enjoy it, but uh, I think those are at least a couple right there. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to someone who's in attendance at our live attendance at our dinner. This is uh, Jeffrey Stachel, he has a question for you. Thanks so much for your observations. I hope your afternoon is as pretty as ours is. Um, you pretty much already touched on uh, the issue of 5G, Huawei. Uh, augmenting that, could you give us your thoughts on how much we have to fear 
from that kind of intrusion into our business model that TikTok, so forth. Yeah, so uh, I, I both want to encourage you and everyone to take it seriously. Um, what China has done is gotten a march on us when it comes to the development and deployment of 5G technology. And the systems that they are using, both hardware and software, are purpose-built to scoop up data and transfer it to China so it can be processed, largely using artificial intelligence, to give China a competitive advantage in almost every sphere you can imagine, whether it's military or whether it's intelligence or technology or science or environment or economy, whatever it might be, they're gonna have an edge. So that is all real and we shouldn't discount it. Second thing I would say though is that I've never known technology to end, Techno technological development to end. We are making a really big deal right now about 5G. I cannot believe that there won't be a 6G or a 7G or a 10G or whatever. Uh, so we have to take the current shortfall that we're in seriously. We let ourselves get behind. But we also need to be really investing in the future. Where do we go from here? Um, as, as the great one would say, skate to where the puck is going to be. And that is what we need to be thinking about in the technology space as well. Uh, not just fighting the battle that we're behind in, but also preparing for the one that's going to be well ahead. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Pavel Kozhennikov, who I believe is with uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Our relationship with Russia is worse now than it has ever been, and that includes the Cold War. Our tanks, 240 kilometers from St. Petersburg, our jets are in Ukraine, and in the Black Sea, our rockets are three minutes of flight from the Russian main cities. We impose sanctions after sanctions on Russia. Mr. Trump has imposed 49 sanctions. Maybe it is time to start talking to Russians? Aren't you afraid that a silly malfunction of the computer system would start a nuclear war? Do you really think that there will be a winner in the nuclear war between us and Russia? Well, so many things in your question there. I'll try to address different pieces of them. First off, by definition, there is no winner in a nuclear war. Nuclear war is a failure, and nuclear war is a disaster for everybody. So we need to prevent nuclear war. Uh, second, um, you are absolutely right uh, in terms of the relationship between the United States and Russia, although I would phrase it differently. I would say Russia's relationship with the rest of the world is worse than it has ever been since the Cold War, or perhaps even during the Cold War. Uh, they have attacked their neighbors. They've taken their neighbor's territory. They have disrupted uh, economies. They have disrupted political systems. They have tried to influence our elections, elections in France, elections in Germany. They have poisoned citizens in foreign countries, in UK, in Germany, in Poland, in Georgia. Um, they have behaved incredibly recklessly and dangerously. And they do this uh, with, with impunity. I think what the Obama administration did was too little too late. Uh, the reset policy, which lasted six years, basically gave a green light to President Putin to pursue these sorts of things because he felt there was no pushback and no resistance. The Obama administration, after six years in, did uh, implement a much tougher set of policies on Russia. I think it did cause Russia to pause a little bit, but not before they invaded Ukraine, not before they annexed Crimea, not before they launched the war in, in the Donbas. Um, from the Trump administration, I think that uh, President Trump has been wise to avoid personalizing the relationship with Russia in terms of President Putin and, and saying that we're going to you know, criticize him or attack him. He wants to leave the door open to having a conversation with President Putin, while meanwhile authorizing his administration to indeed put in place or, or to continue a tough policy of sanctions because of their human rights abuses or sanctions because of the script ball poisoning or the annexation of Crimea or their attacks on Ukraine. Uh, they've also uh, dr dramatically exploited their intelligence facilities and diplomatic facilities in the United States, so we had to curtail those as well. 
which this administration has done. Um, so I think it's necessary. Russia responds to pushback and responds to use of force. If they don't feel that, then they just continue. And so I, I think what we need to see for once is Russia to begin to rethink its own policies uh, that have been aggressive toward the West and, and aggressive towards its neighbors. Thank you. The next question is from uh, retired Lieutenant General Chris Miller, who is with the United States Air Force Academy. General, Ambassador wow, Great. congratulations, you made it. <laughs> retired. It has been a long time since spending hours on various topics in airless committee rooms at the NATO headquarters in FRA. Thank you for your service since then. My question, given the increasingly checkered history of many multilateral organizations at actually solving problems, sometimes successful, sometimes seemingly more often not, and given growing optical dissonances like the composition of the current UN Human Rights Council, do you see it as more viable to try to reform and revitalize these institutions, or do we need another construct and if so, how would you envision it? Well, thank you very much for the question. It's great to hear from you, Chris. As is evident in the question there, we work together quite a bit at NATO. Um, Chris is a veteran of working on the 1999 NATO strategic concept, which was approved at the Washington summit in 1999. And he was in the defense shop and I was in the political shop at the US mission to NATO. Um, I'm both uh, surprised and delighted that anyone who spent hours doing that nonetheless made it to Lieutenant General, uh, Lieutenant General in the Air Force. So congratulations and great to hear from you. Um, as far as the question goes, I think it's a great question, but I also think this term multilater multilateralism or multilateral institutionalism is sometimes a, a thrown around as if it means something on its own without really unpacking what it actually means. Take the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council has the force of law behind it under international law. Uh, it can pass uh, resolutions that authorize use of force and so forth. Uh, it's meant to create international peace and security. But, and so people say, oh yeah, using the UN, that's multilateralism. But the UN Security Council is made up of three countries that see the world largely the same way, the US, UK, and France and two countries that see it from a fundamentally different perspective, Russia and China. And so if we are not able to agree in the UN Security Council to do anything, it makes the UN impotent, that's true. But why is it impotent? It's impotent because of China and Russia. So we talk about this as a failure of the US to use multilateral institutions because we can't go to the UN, but it's actually because of the lack of adherence to democratic values of China and Russia uh, that make the UN an impossible place to go. Uh, some organizations, especially those that tend to be more like-minded, work pretty well. I would still put NATO in that category where we served. Uh, despite everything and all the complaints that all the administrations have made over time about NATO, there is still a like-mindedness and still an effectiveness to NATO when the uh, members of NATO put their minds to something. And I think that's terribly important. I think the OECD could be an organization like that, but it has to police its own rules. Same with the WTO. I don't think we policed our rules when we let China in. And then with China in and violating those rules, we're still not policing the organization, but we potentially could. The other thing I would say is that there is no organization that really brings together the right group of empowered democracies in the world today. The UN Security Council leaves out Germany. Uh, the G7 leaves out some countries, uh, such as South Korea or Australia. Uh, so I do think that there is perhaps room for a different grouping. We've seen the G7. That was in power. That was in the large bring in Russia at one point, G8, big mistake. Um, G20 is another one, maybe too broad and not like-minded enough. There's one that a friend of mine at the Atlantic Council has proposed that I think does make sense which is he calls a D10, uh, a 10 democracies, which would be the G7 countries, but then adding to those seven countries, um, uh, Australia and South Korea, and I believe the European Union. 
Um, that would be an interesting mix if we were able to put that one together. And maybe we should think about building there and expanding from there as well, too. Uh, there's no major organization right now other than the G20 that brings India in. And I think it would be very wise of us to try to be more inclusive of India, given that they are the most populous democracy in the world. Thank you. The next question is from our member, Sunny Tele. Will Ukraine eventually be divided to reflect the status quo? No, I don't believe so. Um, there is a vast majority of the population of Ukraine, including those who've been displaced by war. Remember, there were 4 million people in the Donbass before Russia attacked. It's down to about a million and a half. Those two and a half million people are displaced. Only about 500,000 went to Russia, about 2 million went to the West. Um, and there is no way that they would accept uh, that Russia has just taken over their territory, that they'll turn around and walk away. Uh, so it's going to, it may be divided in practice on the ground for a very long time to come, but I can't see any Ukrainian government um, surviving in power without being overthrown by its own people if it made any gesture towards accepting these Russian occupations. Thank you. The next question has quite a bit to it. I know, Ambassador, you can see it also, but I will read it for the benefit of our participants. This is again from our friend Pavel from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. You have called Ukraine as a free democratic country. Don't you know that the Ukrainian government supports the SS collaborationists, Banderas, whose SS veterans freely matching in Kiev, Lviv, and other cities of this country. These criminals were killing the Jews in Babi Yar, and now the Ukrainian authorities erect the monuments to the SS soldiers. How can we support such a government? Yeah. Number two, the Crimea had a referendum where 96% voted for the reunification with Russia. We support Kosovo, reunification of Germany, other countries, but we do not recognize the reunification of the people of Crimea. My brother was at that time in the Crimea, his witness that the referendum was free. Yeah, so uh, first off, the first part of the question, that's completely wrong. Um, the government of Ukraine does not support the uh, SS, Bandera, fascists, etc. cetera. Um, that is in the category of fake news. The president of Ukraine is Jewish. And the president of Ukraine is an ethnic Russian uh, speaker, a native Russian speaker from Ukraine. Um, so are many in his government. Um, the people of Ukraine uh, do not make much of a difference as to whether you are a native Russian speaker or a native Ukrainian speaker. They identify themselves as Ukrainians. Uh, the, there are fringe groups in Ukraine. There are Bander, Banderistas. There are, uh, you know, people who are, you know, supporting you know, legacy groups that have been tied to the SS. They do exist, just like we have fringe groups in our country or in any democracy. That does not mean that they are supported by the government. And in fact, uh, the current government of Ukraine is very much against that and actually trying to develop a better relationship with Russia, except that Russia is not interested. Uh, in terms of the referendum in Crimea, remember that Russia had uh, taken over Crimea and it was an occupied territory at the time the referendum was held. Uh, therefore, they control the media, they control the question, they control the advertising, and even under international law, no referendum is valid if it is held under circumstances of occupation. Uh, also, you have to look at who fled Crimea. Um, there are plenty of Ukrainians who, and uh, Tartars as well, who uh, fled Crimea or were forced out of Crimea and do not support Russia's continued occupation. Uh, moreover, it is wrong to talk about this as a reunification. The history of Crimea is pretty unique and pretty complex. There were a few hundred years when it was part of the Russian Empire and then part of the Soviet Union when it was connected to Ukraine, but part of the Soviet Union. There were also periods of time when it was uh, more closely connected to Turkey or to uh, even uh, Greek communities. Um, Ukraine itself, there's a very long history of, that is really unique to Crimea and to isolate it and saying the only one that matters is the time when it was connected to Russia is really a disservice to the Tartars and the people of Crimea. Thank you. Our next question is from our member, Dr. Elliot Cohen. Your thoughts on how we should deal with Iran. Should we continue our current policy or do something different? Well, this is a tough one. Um, What's interesting is that successive administrations in the U.S. have had the same objective. 
we want to prevent Iran from having the technology needed to produce a nuclear weapon. Uh, in the Bush administration, uh, this was a zero tolerance for enrichment. Uh, we had successive unanimous Security Council resolutions saying that you know, we can help with Iran, we can help Iran on a civilian nuclear program through the IAEA with provision and recovery of fissile materials, but no enrichment because we don't believe that they will tell the truth or that they will conduct a program without trying to create a nuclear weapon. That was a pretty safe assumption because they did hide things and have their nuclear facilities uh, trying to develop nuclear weapons. Then we had, uh, during the Obama administration, a relaxation of that policy where uh, there was an acknowledgement that, well, Iran is already enriching and we can accept some. It's really a matter of setting limits on how much enrichment and how much storage of enriched uranium would be okay. And with agreeing on some limits with Iran, we reached the JCPOA, which also had a sunset clause as to when that agreement would expire. So that was basically imposing a, a break uh, into the system where Iran was not gonna go from point A to point B of having a nuclear weapons program within 18 months, we now have a circuit breaker. Uh, but that circuit breaker expires after a period of time. And meanwhile, Iran has enrichment, has storage and continues research. Now you have the Trump administration, which has said, well, that was a terrible deal. And we're gonna blow the whole thing up, uh, which has also not prevented Iran from continuing to do research and enrichment and storage and continues to put them in a position where they may eventually have a nuclear weapon. So none of these approaches under any of these administrations has actually produced the result that we want. Uh, I am convinced that whether it is a second Trump term or a Biden term, the objective will still be the same. The objective will be uh, not to create circumstances or allow circumstances to grow up where Iran does have a nuclear weapon. Uh, I think in order to do that, it is very tricky and very complicated. We need a combination of things. We ought to try to figure out some common policies with our allies again, because the way France, the UK, Germany, and Italy handle Iran matters. And if we can be in more alignment, we can be more effective in dealing with Iran. Second, I think what the Trump administration has done effectively is a good thing. And I would expect, or I'd assume that the Biden administration, if it's elected, would continue. And that is to call greater attention, not only to the nuclear portfolio, but also to Iran's other regional activities and to push back on those. I think that does make sense. A uh, third thing that I think this is where the question might be getting at it is the tone and the bellicosity of our approach toward Iran. Uh, the Trump administration has been extremely loud and vocal and bellicose in the way it has talked about policy toward Iran. I think it called a zero tolerance policy. It, it is just all out. And what I would say about that is it alienates our allies to, to create that tone. And it also puts the Iranians in a position where they feel they have to push back against that. So I'm not sure that's the most effective style to adopt, even though the content of that pressure on Iran in order to prevent a nuclear weapons program, it probably makes sense. So uh, I guess what I would hope for is a little more diplomatic tone, a little more creative tone, but one with a very firm policy underneath it. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Peter Gerfein. China has invested heavily in Africa among other areas. Do you have any views as to post-COVID Africa and where the U.S. and China will figure in that future? Yeah, so that's an excellent question because China has really focused on Africa as a source of uh, raw materials and a place to sell cheap Chinese goods. Uh, and it is providing financing for this. Uh, it is uh, willing to invest in infrastructure projects. And it has very few uh, compunctions about working with governments where there are human rights abuses or even uh, where bribery is part of the way of doing business. Uh, that is a very difficult situation for anyone to compete with when China is willing to behave that way. However, the good news in that story is that African governments and African people have begun to object to the nature of China's behavior in the region. They like the infrastructure investment, but they don't like the cavalierness. They don't like the Chinese workers. Uh, they don't like the lack of reciprocal economic benefits. And uh, some 
do also criticize them for not uh, helping Africa develop and advance. And so there is an opening there for the US. I'm very pleased that this has become a principal concern of the US Development Finance Corporation. Uh, as your audience may know, OPIC, uh, you know, uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, was reformed uh, over the past couple of years through an act of Congress and has been renamed the Development Finance Corporation. They've been given an infusion of cash and their mandate is in many ways to try to find ways using market mechanisms, but, but with uh, uh, market-based, but, but government targeted resources to try to compete more effectively with countries like China in places like Africa. Uh, I, I think there have been a few good examples of this. I hope that there are more to come. I also think that um, uh, one of DSC's um, great possibilities is to be the catalyst of force multipliers. If DSC is willing to identify a project or a country or to invest or to guarantee investment, it can then pull along with it other private sector US investment to multiply the scale of that. And that can also help the US compete in these countries. Um, but again, I wanna stress that the, the target of this is not US economic benefit per se, it's giving the countries and the people of the region an alternative to what China is putting on the table. And if we can give them an alternative that is more empowering of their own societies, they benefit from that, as well as the US benefiting from a, a, a more productive relationship. Thank you. Another question from Simi Kalei. You said you were in Turkey recently. What do you think about the Erdogan government and their policies, for example, buying Russian missiles while being part of NATO? Yeah. Um, first off, um, President Erdogan has clamped down on democracy in society in ways that we haven't seen in Turkey for a long time. And no matter who you talk to, they, they all acknowledge this. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in talking with members of faculty at a university in Turkey, uh, you ask them questions about the government or about their academic freedom. They just instinctively look over their shoulder and, and they, I have to be careful in how I answer this question. Uh, like us, um, university in Turkey was doing online education and the faculty members were really thinking carefully about what happens if the sessions are recorded and they're in dialogue with their students who ask questions, they answer questions, or what happens if there's a government monitor on the Zoom that's going on that is class uh, at a university, could they then be arrested or accused of, of some, uh, some crime or treason from, from doing something? So there is a genuine worry among people about the overreach uh, into uh, freedoms and democracy in the country. At the same time, almost everybody that I spoke with, whether they were more sympathetic or less sympathetic to Erdogan, uh, felt that this is a temporary situation. Now, one to three years, uh, Erdogan will not be leading the country anymore. Uh, there will be change of some type. And they were optimistic about what that change would look like. Uh, as for NATO, uh, I do think that the S-400 issue is a major issue for NATO in the United States. Uh, we don't want a situation where, through Turkey, Russia is gaining access to technical information and intelligence that would make Russia more effective against U.S. aircraft and, and Western aircraft uh, than they would otherwise be. So the dangers of this are real. But I also have to say that I think we, the U.S. and NATO to some degree, bear a share of the blame for how we got to this point. Uh, Turkey is in a very difficult neighborhood. Russia to the north, Iran to the east, Kurdish terrorist groups inside its country. They are different from Kurdish groups that are in northern Iraq, for example, where they have a good relationship. Iraq is also a neighbor. Syria with Bashar Assad you know, decimating his country, destroying his own people, um, and also um, attacking Kurds there. Lebanon. Hezbollah, uh, potential conflict between uh, Israel and Lebanon or Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Libya, which was left a disaster after we toppled Gaddafi but had no follow-on security program. Uh, there's now civil war going on there. Uh, they have border disputes with Greece. The Cyprus, so Cyprus is divided. 
um, they are in in a very, very difficult neighborhood. I should have mentioned Syrian refugees and also ISIS, uh, just you know, round out the period Turkey's facing. Um, we are dealing with a lot, a lot of the same, we had to deal with ISIS, with Syria, with Iraq, with Iraq, and so on. So um, we largely have overlapping interests with Turkey in this region but we have not managed to have a productive strategic dialogue with Turkey about how we deal with these issues. At the end of the day, if we don't want to be in Syria, if we don't want to be in Iraq, if we don't want to be the principal bulwark against Iran, then we need Turkey to be there. Uh, they are the largest, strongest, most capable country in the region, and one that is uh, in, in most ways aligned with the United States. So we really need to figure out that strategic relationship. If we do that, I think we will have greater success in talking with Turkish leadership about human rights and democracy. I think we would have greater success in talking with them about choice of, of uh, air defense missiles and why a Russian one is gonna be a problem for us. Uh, so we, we, we kind of blew it over you know, a 10 to, 10 to 12 year period. Uh, I think we still have a chance, but it is, is much harder rolling back than it was drifting uh, to where we've gotten to to begin with. Thank you. Um, if we could just briefly uh, revisit a previous question and then we'll move on to other topics. Um, Mr. Pavel Kozhevnikov suggests maybe it's time for Cold War policy negotiating, not confronting the Russian parliament, asked Congress many times to start negotiating, but Congress did not respond. Well, the, yes, uh, the Congress doesn't negotiate on behalf of the United States. The uh, president and the executive branch negotiates on behalf of the United States, just as the president of Russia and the, and the government of Russia negotiate on behalf of Russia. So uh, I think parliamentary dialogues are a good thing. Um, we've had them in the past. Unfortunately, members of the RADA have much less power now and uh, um, are not as effective interlocutors as they were, say, 20 years ago, uh, or as U.S. members of Congress are. But nonetheless, some kind of parliamentary dialogue is a good thing. Um, when it comes to nuclear issues, I, I do have to, to come back to that. It was part of the earlier question. Um, uh, it's interesting to me how sometimes the, um, I, I don't know whether it's the media or the administration's own communications efforts do not manage to get the point across. Um, we have a nuclear agreement, New START Treaty with Russia that is about to expire. When this agreement was put in place, it was criticized pretty severely in the US for weakening verification provisions that had been in place in prior arms control agreements. Uh, this was what Russia wanted and the perception at the time was that, well, it was so important to have this nuclear deal with Russia, we could afford less verification. Uh, plus, we have a cooperative relationship with Russia, so we don't need as much verification. Well, that all turned out to be wrong. Russia has turned out to be extraordinarily more aggressive. They have modernized their nuclear arsenal. They've increased the, both the quality and the numbers and the location of deployments. And they violated the INF Treaty, so put in, in play a whole new class of weapons. So there are a number of things that have caused us to be concerned about what Russia's doing with nuclear weapons. And while you could argue that, okay, why don't you just extend the current nuclear agreement? Um, the US administration said, well, we would be willing to extend the current nuclear agreement, but we need to have verification provisions now uh, that reflect the lack of trust in the relationship and are more in line with the sorts of verification provisions that we had agreed previously uh, during the Cold War and after the Cold War. So the answer to Russia is yes, we want to see an extension of the New Star Treaty, but with stronger verification provisions and Russia has rejected that. Uh, we would also like to see uh, future nuclear arms control agreements include China. Uh, China is acting uh, much more aggressively in this neighborhood. It has a substantial nuclear arsenal and that arsenal is not covered by any arms control agreements other than the global non-proliferation treaties. So uh, we would love to see US and Russia work together to try to create a framework to bring China into that as well and have real nuclear arms control. Uh, but again, Russia has not shown any interest in that. 
Thank you. Another question from David Bain. Turning back to the intersection of COVID-19 and politics, how do you see the implications of growing populist and authoritarian trends in Europe? Are they also a shorter term challenge like that in Turkey? Yeah, I see these as a wave, uh, but not a fundamental change. Uh, the, the, co the countries that most people talk about are Poland and Hungary. Uh, you can bring up a few other examples as well. But I would think it, I'd say it's a mistake to separate them from movements that we see elsewhere in Europe, like the Five Star uh, Movement in Italy, the Liga in Italy, um, the um, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, the National Front in France, um, uh, UK Independence Party, Sweden Democrats, True Finns. Uh, there are far right and populist movements and some far left populist movements in countries all over Europe. The reason for this is a genuine perception within the public that the established political elites were not getting it. They, the publics were deeply concerned about the economy, about jobs, about globalization, about immigration, about changes to culture and identity that come from immigration. And they wanted their political leaders to deal with those. Uh, when political leaders didn't, uh, they turned to more extreme parties. And, and demanded uh, you know, more extreme solutions. I think uh, that's a phase. Uh, these political parties and leaders are not necessarily better able to deliver than anybody else. And I think it is a challenge to more traditional and, and more liberal parties in Europe to uh, compete effectively and find better solutions to what publics are concerned about rather than telling publics that they shouldn't be concerned to begin with. Uh, in the case of Hungary, uh, I want to single this one out in particular because there's also a unique element to this. The government of uh, Orban, the Fidesz government, is a conservative political government. They are not far-right extremists. There is a far-right extreme party in Hungary called Jobbik, uh, which uh, is as bad as you would imagine in terms of anti-Semitism and, and um, uh, seeking to undermine democratic institutions, but the or had been. But the uh, Fidesz government doesn't fit that description. They are conservative. Uh, they would fit the description of uh, many conservative movements in the US or elsewhere in Europe. And they are frustrated that uh, the definition of democracy as understood particularly by Brussels and the European Union is liberal as opposed to conservative. And they don't wanna be straight jacketed into a liberal interpretation of what it means to be a democracy. Uh, so that has caused them to uh, use Brussels something as a foil and to argue for more conservative policies on family, on language, on immigration uh, than uh, Brussels and the European Union would otherwise say that they should have. Uh, this has worked to Orban's benefit to be able to articulate that. that. All that being said, I don't believe that Orban or the Law and Justice Party in Poland or many of the other movements that we've seen are genuinely anti-democratic or will reverse the course of democracy in Europe. They are reflections of a public mood that is frustrated. And I think these moods will change over time as new political leaders and, and new events take place. So again, um, going back to my, my thinking about negotiations, nothing is ever over. Uh, this is a phase we're going through, it'll change again. Thank you. I'd like to introduce a question now from a mobile caller. Please comment on the absence of interest in the countries of Central and South America by our administrations, except in issues of migration and drug trafficking. The only mention this evening has been that of Venezuela. Do we not have a greater opportunity to support the development of a strong alliance with many of those countries? That is a great question, and thank you for bringing it up. I completely agree with you. Uh, if you look at the population of China and the population of Central and South America, or you look at the economic output of those, uh, Central and South America are right on par with the relationship with China. Yet we put so much emphasis on uh, market in China, manufacturing in China, trade with China, and we don't put the same emphasis on Latin America when it is right here in our own hemisphere, and we would benefit from being part of a more connected and more prosperous uh, hemisphere. So I think we definitely underplay this. Uh, it is difficult. Um, we have populist governments now in Brazil and Mexico. 
uh, that have their own issues. Uh, we've seen some leftist governments, uh, such as in Venezuela, but also in other countries in South America, that would be very difficult to work with. But the broader point that you're making in your question is that this ought to be a focal point, not an afterthought I completely agree with. Thank you. I have a question from Gary Burkhart, one of our members just here, who's live with us. Um, public debt as a percentage of GDP is quite high <clears throat> at present. Are there limits? And if so, where are they? It's a great question. Uh, I'm reminded um, of when I started my career as an intelligence analyst. And I was struck after writing, you know, comment and you know, fact and then comment, fact and opinion about what's going on and what is likely to happen. And it struck me one day that the most likely thing to happen is a continuation of present trends. And that is always correct right up until the day that it's wrong. And then you're surprised and you have one of these failures of intelligence and a shock to the global order. And I'm afraid that's what we have with the deficit spending and the massive debts that we have. They're fine today. They'll be fine tomorrow. They'll be fine the day after tomorrow. And we can probably do this for quite a long time, right up until the day something snaps and then it crashes. And that would be an absolute disaster. So the, the answer to your question, I mean, there's no one, uh, I, I certainly don't believe there's anyone who can credibly tell you this is the limit and no more. We, we simply don't know. It's there somewhere, but we don't know where it is. And therefore, as a matter of um, responsible governance, uh, we need to be ever mindful of seeking to limit and reduce our exposure. Sometimes we might make a calculation, such as during coronavirus, that if we don't spend more now, our economy could tank, and that's going to put millions and millions of people out of work. It would be much harder to recover from that. Uh, now is the time to spend. But at a certain point, we have to be mindful of the fact that we can't do it forever, and we should correct course ourselves before some shock does happen and then we pay the cost of that. I would like to take, uh, yeah, we have about five, four or five minutes left, and I would like to ask another question circling back to your discussion of our recovery from COVID-19. Um, you have cited some examples of your travel in other countries and uh, the strategy to get this under control and also express that you think it may be many years uh, until we can do that in the United States. Is it possible at this point to implement a national strategy? Um, and if so, how do we do that? Given we have 50 plus self-governing districts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the short answer is that I don't think it's possible to implement a national strategy. Uh, the way our country is made up, things are going to be decided at a state level and even at a city level uh, more than at a federal level. What I think is possible is to try to convene people more effectively and to build a greater consensus across federal, state, and, and municipal levels as to what good protocols are. Um, so much of the debate over policy in dealing with coronavirus is so politicized and, and so uh, venomous. I don't think there's anybody that wants the disease to spread. I don't think there's anybody that wants to see people die. Uh, but what we have is a debate over how much uh, pre preventive and protective measures are necessary versus how costly are those measures in terms of our economy, our recovery, uh, and our, even our psychology, you know, normal life and kids going to school and so forth. And I think if we focused more to talk about protocols and protocols that are flexible based on population density and, and uh, incidence of disease and so forth, but to at least try to build a greater consensus around what the right protocols are. Uh, I think we do a better job and it'd still be decided by states and by cities and there'd be fluctuations in implementation, but uh, I think that would take us a little bit further than what we have now. 
Thank you. Uh, unless we have a last minute question, we have just about one minute left, but uh, I would like to end by saying, expressing our extreme and complete gratitude to you for being with us tonight and our hope that you will agree to do it again at another time. We're gonna keep our fingers crossed for that. I also have a comment from Sky Forster that says, he hopes that you end up in the next administration, whatever that may be. <laughs> and to our members and our guests here today, I would just like to uh, let you know that our next speaker series webinar is November 10th. It is entitled Digital Assets, The Changing World of Money. We will be hosting a financial economist in the U.S. Department of State of Monetary Affairs to discuss digital currencies and all of the related issues. Also on December 1st, we will be hosting former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, who will speak to us on topics related to his new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. So for more information on our programs or to join our mailing list, please visit our website at csworldaffairs.org. And again, thank you so much, Ambassador Volker. It was wonderful to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, Sky, and, and everyone who, who took part. It's been a real pleasure and an honor for me, and I hope to do it again, as you say, but next time in person. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>